Welcome to the Consulting Specifying Engineer webcast, Critical Power, Transformers, Uninterruptible Power Supplies, and Switchgear, sponsored by ASCO Power Technologies. I'm your moderator, Jack Smith, with Consulting Specifying Engineer, Pure Power, and CFE Media. Here is a list of the learning objectives for today's webcast. We will cover these in today's presentation. Today's presenters today uh, today's presenters are both members of the Consulting Specifying Engineer Editorial Advisory Board. Kenneth Katsmita holds the role of Engineering Manager for the Mission Critical Sector at Jacobs. Over 20 years, Ken has built a catalog of more than 700,000 square feet of completed data center and commissioning work for numerous commercial, federal, and municipal clients. He is responsible for the engineering and designing and commissioning of power distribution systems for mission critical facilities. His expertise has given him the opportunity to publish articles on mission critical power distribution systems for a consulting specifying engineer. Ken was a 2010 Consulting Specifying Engineer 40 Under 40 winner. Richard Bedvik is a Senior Electrical Engineer and Acoustics Engineer with IMEG Corporation, where he has expertise in the healthcare, education, commercial, and government sectors. His electrical engineering experience includes lighting design, power distribution, emergency power systems, and fire alarm systems. He was a 2015 Consulting Specifying Engineer 40 Under 40 winner. Thank you, Ken and Rich, for joining us today. Ken, you are our first speaker, and the floor is all yours. Thanks, Jack. So how much money did your electrical system cost you last year? When we talk about this and ask people this question, they seem to talk about the energy consumption of the load. Uh, the motors, the HVC systems, the computers, maybe the lights. And at the same time, um, when we talk about saving energy, they also talk about the load. You know, what's the advanced technologies that use less energy? You know, is it more efficient HVAC systems? Is it more efficient motors, maybe LED lighting or LCD monitors? They also talk about energy management systems, ways to shut off the equipment if it's not being used, such as occupancy sensors, maybe temperature controls. We also talk about HVAC optimization, so heat recovery, um, utilizing some of that heat we're taking out of the system, maybe thermal or energy storage, producing ice in the off hours at less with less cost so you can use them during peak hours. What they don't tend to talk about is the electrical distribution system itself. The electrical systems also consume energy in the form of losses. So losses are basically due to inefficiencies of the equipment and the distribution system. When you look at uh, facilities that consume a lot of power, similar to like a data center, um, you can tell here by the graph that the electrical distribution losses equal to about 12% of the total energy consumption for the facility. Um, this one in particular is a 2,000 megawatt data center. Um, you can see the mechanical systems have been, you know, utilizing more efficient mechanical systems to get that piece down, but there's still a 12% loss in just the electrical systems itself. And what does that mean? Well, for this two megawatt data center, at 10 cents a kilowatt, that averages out to about $280,000 a year in just wasted energy. So I'm sure there's facilities people out there that can utilize that $280,000. Next, I want to look at a typical electrical infrastructure. Um, so you have utility coming in at a, a higher voltage. It goes through some kind of transformation to bring it down to a voltage to utilize by the facility, maybe a 480 goes through some switch gear. Um, if it's a critical facility, there might be a UPS um, and then some kind of transformation to get it down to the utilization voltage uh, out at the, at the equipment. So when you look at that infrastructure, there's really five uh, components that have the highest losses. You look at the medium voltage to low voltage transformer. So there's transformer losses, no load losses, core losses. Um, the switch gear itself, which has heat losses, and in the protection unit has some heat losses. 
Uh, the UPS has a rectifier that goes from AC to DC, so there's losses there, and then from DC back to AC in the inverter, so there's additional losses. Um, the next thing is the conductor. There's heat losses involved with the conductor. And then the fifth part is a PDU or basically a transformer, again, that steps it down to the 208 volts. Um, again, no load or core losses. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rich to talk a little bit about the first two items on the list. Thank you, Ken. As mentioned, transformers are part of every electrical system. And as seen in the graphic, the medium voltage to low voltage transformer at the building service is the first opportunity for energy losses. Additional transformers to step down from 480 to 208 volt are not shown in this graphic, but as we know, they occur many times in a building. Designers have the option of reducing the quantity of transformers and thus increasing their size or designers can distribute transformers throughout the building to reduce speeder costs and thus speeder losses. So essentially you can either have more transformers that are smaller or fewer transformers that are bigger. Because transformers are a substantial portion of system losses, the topology of the system chosen should take transformer efficiency into consideration. In 2002, NEMA issued a standard for transformer energy efficiency in reaction to the U.S. Department of Energy guidelines. This resulted in the TP1 classification that has been widely used since. In 2016, another update changed the required energy efficiencies for several transformer classifications, including TP1, CSL-3, and NEMA Premium. The graphic shows required energy efficiencies for the three classifications at several KVA ratings. So the left group is the 15 KVA rating, and the bars represent TP1 in blue, CSL3 in orange, and NEMA premium in gray. The transformer size increases from left to right up to 300 KVA to identify that as a transformer increases in size, the required efficiencies also increase. The graphic also identifies the increase in efficiency requirements between the three classifications. Now, it's important to note that these efficiency ratings are at a 35% transformer load and using only linear or resistive loads. When sizing transformers, though, we need to take loading into consideration, and it's important for the reasons that we're going to discuss next. Now, energy losses within a transformer come from several sources. Losses inherent to any transformer may be load dependent or load independent, which is also known as core losses. The pie chart shown is not labeled because percentages of each type of loss will depend based on the transformer loading and the material selection. Load losses are going to increase as current through the windings increase. Other losses are called core losses and they are constant regardless of the transformer loading and they essentially exist any time a transformer is energized. Winding resistance losses, as listed here, are due to current through the winding, which results in power dissipation. Eddy currents are induced in the core and result in resistive heating. Stray magnetic field losses include energy put into generating a magnetic field, but some of that magnetic field isn't inducing a current in the secondary. You can consider this as leakage flux, and this leakage can induce eddy currents in adjacent materials. Hysteresis losses occur from magnetic fields changing direction within the core. Magnetostriction vibration is another form of lost energy, and really both eddy currents and magnetostriction are responsible for the humming or the buzzing associated with transformers. Both noise and vibration are example of work being done, and that work is part of system losses. Now, characteristics that designers can choose to impact the magnitude of these losses include the winding material, the temperature rise rating, and a nonlinear rating. For example, the choice of copper or aluminum windings affects the winding resistance. Temperature rise rating design affects both load and core losses. Common temperature rise ratings are 80, 115, and 150 degrees Celsius. And which selection is the most efficient depends on the loading. Now, this rating also affects the physical size of the transformer and the heat load that will be generated. Lastly, nonlinear loads can greatly increase system losses as these load types are not addressed at all in the NEMA classification rating. 
Increases in harmonic content increase current and thus system losses. So due to the increase in nonlinear loads in modern buildings, it's important for designers to consider which rating is best for long-term energy savings. The temperature rise rating for transformers in a building will affect how the HVA system, HVAC system is sized. Uh, and the HVAC system is required to provide cooling for those spaces. There's sort of a cyclic nature to HVAC sizing and that the HVAC system increases to provide cooling and therefore so does the load on the electrical system, which can then increase the size of the transformers, which can then increase the size of the HVAC system. Locating the electrical service transformer outdoors can reduce the interior building load, which then reduces the load on the HVAC system. When the service transformers must be indoors, choosing a lower temperature rise may be prudent. One way to reduce load losses is to reduce winding resistance. A common transformer impedance rating around 5% has been used for decades. In an effort to reduce load losses, however, lower transformer impedance rating, ratings have been offered more recently. So this graphic depicts the available fault current in several transformer sizes and four different impedances. Transformer size increases from left to right from 45 kVA to 750 kVA. Blue, the blue bar there depicts a 1.5% impedance. Orange illustrates 3%, gray is 5%, and yellow is 6%. As expected, lower impedances have higher available fault currents, and thus higher available fault currents affect the short circuit rating, or SCCR, of the electrical distribution equipment, and therefore increase cost as ratings increase. Additionally, we have arc flash and selective coordination that are impacted, and the designer needs to weigh all the costs associated with an electrical system when they're considering lower transformer impedances. And additionally, HVAC equipment commonly carries like a 5,000 amp SCCR. Uh, the next step up from there is 65,000. So it's a pretty big jump. And increasing that rating is going to increase the mechanical system cost. Once the service transformer has reduced the system voltage to a usable level, such as typically 480 volts or 208 volts, the distribution equipment that provides overcurrent protection should be evaluated for system losses. While this graphic illustrates switchgear in one location, uh, the losses we cover affect all overcurrent protection equipment. There are two primary types of overcurrent protection, fuses and circuit breakers. The contact resistance in these types affect the power dissipated in the device. That is to say that the more contact resistance you have, the more power dissipation you have. And anything that is power dissipation within the distribution is considered a loss. So this graph illustrates power losses for overcurrent devices below 600 amps. It shows that fuses with switches, shown in gray and yellow up top, have the highest losses, and those losses predictably increase with current. Both type J and type RK5 fuses are represented here. The orange and blue lines in the middle illustrate the fuse contribution only and do not include the switch that typically accompanies a fuse. This is shown to identify that contribution so you can see how much of that large loss at the very top of the graph is really just from the fuse itself. At the red line at the bottom is a typical molded case circuit breaker. And the increase that we see around 200 amps, I believe, is due to the differences in frame sizes and thus differences in contact area and associated resistance. So this next slide, while looking similar to before, this is for circuit breakers and fuses rated above 600 amps. And we can see that the type of breaker chosen can affect the power dissipated by the breaker. The orange line at top is a switch with a class L fuse. Uh, the class L fuse contribution is shown in blue all by itself. The red line represents a drawout circuit breaker, and it coincidentally follows the power loss of the class L fuse. And then at the bottom, a fixed circuit breaker is illustrated in purple, as it has the lowest losses of the group. When we look at this, it makes sense that a drawout circuit breaker would have higher losses because of how it contacts the bus with fingers instead of bolted connections. 
Now, the main takeaway with these two graphs is that contact resistance plays a role in wasted energy. Now, the amounts here shown were assuming new and clean contact surfaces and are basically just inherent natures of the contact area that you have. Now, these losses will greatly increase as the contacts become dirtier or looser over time. Uh, facilities can use a thermal imaging camera to identify these loose or dirty connections, which can help prevent or mitigate failures by identifying any required service moving forward. Next, we'll have Ken talk to you about UPS rectifier and inverter losses. Thanks, Rich. So yeah, so the next um, piece of the infrastructure that creates losses is the uh, uninterruptible power supply or UPS. So when we look at a conventional double conversion UPS technology, um, we have the incoming power going through a rectifier, so it converts it from AC to DC, so there's some losses associated with that. Then as it goes through and charges the battery, uh, it comes out the other side as an, through the inverter, which converts it back from DC to AC to the load. So in both of those conversions, we do get a little bit of loss of power. So when you look at the efficiency curve of a UPS, um, at 100%, it's about 94% efficient, and this is kind of uh, your typical older UPS. Um, some of the newer technologies, the newer IGBTs, the new semiconductors, transformerless UPSs, you'll see that actually go up to about 96, 97%, but there is still a percentage of loss at 100%, and then as you go down the curve and the, the load gets less, you'll see a much greater drop in efficiency. So figure about 25% there on the curve, you're 88% efficient. So some of the factors that are involved in, in the efficiency, again, as I said, transformerless or new technologies which drive the efficiency up. But there's also, when you look at the reliability of the system or redundancy you build into a system, so for, say, a data center that may have an N plus 1 UPS for maintenance or reliability or a 2N UPS, yeah, in an M plus one system, you may have a UPS system that's sitting unloaded or 0% load, which is going to be very inefficient, or a 2N UPS where there's an A and a B system. Um, under normal conditions, neither one of those is operating over 50%, so you're more in that 30% range, so you can have a very inefficient system based on the redundancy and reliability of that system. Um, some other things you can look at are different UPS technologies. Um, some rotary systems out there uh, have, a, have a higher efficiency. Um, and then the other thing is just right-sizing the equipment. Um, if you put in, you know, you say 10 years from now, you, you know what your load's going to be, and you put in 1,100 kW UPS, but for the first two years you only operate at 20%, you're going to be operating way on, you know, on low on the curve and very inefficient. So you want to make sure as you size it, you size it so that you right-size the equipment as you go. You want it to be higher on the efficiency curve. One of the ways to do that is with a modular UPS. Uh, a lot of the manufacturers are now providing UPSs that are actually, you know, smaller components into one component. So there might be, in this um, graph, there's actually four seven, 275 kW UPSs that make up an 1100 kW UPS total. So what that allows you to do is allows you to grow with the load. So you can put in two modules or three modules, and then as your load grows, you can grow with it. And what that does is you can those two modules now operate higher on the efficiency curve than if you had all four operating at one time. Um, another thing some vendors are doing is what they call a module management. And basically it allows you to place modules that aren't being used in standby. So in this instance, if I had a load that was 200 kW, I could put the third module, even the second module, in standby, and the single module now can be operating higher on that efficiency curve. Another, another piece of the UPS is uh, eco mode. Um, this basically is a way to basically bypass the rectifier inverter. The load is being sent through the static bypass around the inverter rectifier so that you do not have the losses in the inverter rectifier. Um, you can get an, a UPS up to about 99% efficient this way, but there are some negative effects to doing that. Uh, one is unconditioned power. So the critical load is being exposed to raw utility power. So if there's any fluctuation in voltage or frequency, it will be seen by the critical load. 
Um, the other is transfer time. Um, basically, during an outage, it takes time for the UPS system to detect the failure, turn on the inverter, transfer the ba battery, and then open the bypass switch. So although it is fast enough so that the load doesn't see it, there are other components that can be affected, such as a transformer could saturate, and then when it gets restarted, it will have a large inrush of current that could trip breakers. Um, your static transfer switches downstream could see it as an outage and try to change state. So there are other things you know, involved with the transfer time. Another one is thermal shock. Um, during an event, you know, the UPS is at its critical moment now. It's trying to transfer battery, and now all of a sudden you've introduced another, uh, you know, another operation where you're transferring the load to inverter from the bypass, and it's going to be done in one big step. So that one big step kind of creates a thermal shock to the system, which you could see electronic failures. Another is harmonics. Um, in eco mode, there's no isolation, so all the harmonics from the load are passed right on to the utility or generator. And last is fault discrimination. Basically, under normal operation, the UPS uses the bypass to clear faults. So while you're in eco mode, it's difficult for the UPS to determine whether the voltage drop is a result of a fault downstream or a loss of power upstream. So sometimes you can see a UPS get stuck where it thinks the fault is actually a loss of power and it transfers to inverter and then it's got to take some extra time to then realize it's not and clear it. And all that can put people at danger and equipment at danger because it's extending the clearing time. So just some things you have to be aware of if you use eco mode. Now to compensate for some of those, you'll see some of the manufacturers are now coming out with what they're calling advanced or high efficiency eco mode. And basically what they're doing is keeping the inverter engaged by back feeding it. Um, and this allows the load to still be going through the bypass, not the inverter rectifier, but it keeps that inverter um, energized. And what that helps with is it cuts down on the transfer time. You don't have to wait for the inverter to energize before it transfers. It can be a seamless transfer. And that also helps with conditioning the power. Because it's a seamless transfer, if there's any fluctuation in power, that load can be automatically transferred through the double conversion and then reconditioning the power. So you won't have that uh, unconditioned power going to the source. And also it helps with harmonics. Um, because the inverter is engaged, it can absorb and filter out some of the harmonics, even though the load is not being carried um, through the inverter. The next piece we want to look at is the conductor um, losses. So basically the conductor is, is current going through a resistor, so that creates heat. And when you look at the low voltage side, which is a lot of conductors with a lot of current flow, for example, on a 480 side, there's a 2,000 kW load. It's about 2,400 amps. So that results in about an 800 watt per cable um, loss of heat loss. It's 798. Um, because you need a lot of cables to run that type of amperage. You're looking at seven sets of cables, so that's a total of you know 5,585 watts for that one feeder. One thing to do to help uh, lessen that loss is use medium voltage. Um, medium voltage has a lot less current flowing through that same conductor. So that same 2,000 kW load is only 87 amps at 13.2 kV, which results in a total loss of only 765 watts. So it's an 86% reduction in, in heat loss from that cable by going to 13.2 over 480. And what does that account to? Well, it's about $4,300 of annual savings, which doesn't seem like a lot. But if you look at a data center, which may have multiple paths, multiple redundancies, multiple feeders, that can start to add up really quick. Now, in addition to heat loss with medium voltage, there are other uh, advantages of using medium voltage distribution systems, and I'll turn it over to Rich, and he can talk about them. Thanks, Ken. So, larger buildings or campuses have the option of distributing at higher voltages. Typical medium voltages include 4,160, 12,470, 13,200, and 13,800. Now, when we speak of those terms, we'll typically just abbreviate to 4160, 12.47, 13.2, or 13.8. And in that case, we're really kind of talking about KB. Now, increasing the system voltage decreases the current and thus decreases the losses in material costs, as Ken has previously given some examples for. Now, when the client controls the transformer selection at the service, the efficiency and the impedance can also be chosen. 
Now, utility companies may choose to select lower impedance transformers in order to save them energy and losses. But that happens at an increase in cost of the client's electrical distribution system, as I discussed previously with available fault current impacts for arc flash and selective coordination and SCCR. Now, when you're deciding to distribute at the utility supply voltage, discussions about who is going to own the medium voltage equipment and switch gear will be required as that also has an effect on what the owner is going to have to pay to take advantage of some of these savings. So let's take a look at uh, two examples here. To better illustrate these potential savings, this example compares two feeder arrangements for a two megawatt load fed in air with conduit. The quantity and size of the feeders at 480 volts, as you can see, is substantially more than that of a 13.2 kV feeder. Now, the installation costs used in this example include the wire, the conduit, installation label, uh, labor, I should say, and installation materials, as well as the cost for terminations. And this example is for a near 100-foot feeder length based on available cost data. So what we can see here is that while it's probably going to take a little bit more time to make a termination on a medium voltage cable, if you're making much fewer terminations, that can certainly add up to some savings. Now this is conduit in air. Let's take a look and see what happens when we put this underground. When the same feeders are placed underground, temperature derating needs to be considered. Because the conductors heat the duct bank and thus mutually heat each other, NEC requires that opacity adjustment factors be applied. Now, these adjustment factors reduce current handling of the installed wire. So while in air, in conduit, a conductor will have a rated opacity of X, when you put it in ground and encapsulate it in insulation and then heat it from other conductors, that opacity is going to reduce. And heat loss is simply another way to look at lost energy. Now, just for clarification, the third bullet point there should read a three by four duct bank has an adjustment factor of about 60%, since that's essentially the uh, example that we're using here. Now, as with the previous example, a substantial amount of feeder cost savings can be had by using higher distribution voltages. Now, that said, distributing at higher voltages does require additional transformers, which you have to consider that when you look at the whole system budget. So while it looks on this, the last two examples, it's a no-brainer that you're going to want to use the highest voltage possible for your long feeders. Recognize at some point in time, you're probably going to have to kick that back down. So now you're introducing transformers. So what we're trying to get to is you have an entire system you're trying, looking at, and you're looking at the losses associated with each one, each one. And maybe as a designer, you can build a matrix, try and maximize energy savings by looking at everything that we're discussing. And Ken's going to cover us with the last point five, which is on PDUs. Thanks, Rich. Yeah, so basically a PDU or a, a transformer, you know, it's basically 480 to 208 or your use, usage voltage um, in the data center. A PDU is basically a power distribution unit where there's a transformer and some distribution built into a box. Uh, and as Rich talked about before, it's, it, it's in essence a transformer, so there's core losses and no load losses. One of the things we were looking at from the data center world is trying to eliminate that if we could use higher voltage AC architecture. Um, when you look at the server cabinets or computer voltage, the power supplies actually have a voltage range between 100 and 240 volts. Um, and that was basically done so those components could be used here in the U.S. at the 120 or overseas in Europe and Asia at the 230 volt, um, so they didn't have to change components. So what we were looking at, what you, the, the intent is to utilize that higher voltage range and trans, you know, distribute the power at a higher voltage, say 415, right at the UPS straight to the cabinet. So you're basically eliminating that transformer, eliminating the impedance associated with it. Um, there are some downfalls, as, as Rich had talked about, you know, transformers do create, uh, the impedance does cut down on the fault current, so by eliminating that transformer, you do create higher fault current, so you just have to make sure when you're doing that that you look at how you adjust the system and do a coordination study and short circuit so you can understand uh, the currents that you're talking about. Next, we want to kind of talk about uh, 
a case study that where a lot of these components were utilized to reduce uh, the energy costs for a facility. So this is basically a data center in the Midwest. It's a 2.7 megawatt data center. Um, the infrastructure was set up that it could be expandable to 5.4 in the future. They do have six 1100 kW UPS systems. They're in a 2N UPS configuration, so an A and B, three on each side. The UPSs were modular, so there were three 275 kW modules, and the fourth uh, was not provided day one, so it could be expanded to four modules in the future. We did use 415-240 volt distribution, so there's no step-down transformers. It goes straight from the UPS out to the uh, to cabinet. It has dual 13.2 utility service, um, and we also use 13.2 uh, distribution from the gen plant. So what we're trying to do is take that transformation and push it as close to the load as we could. Um, there are step-down transformers and secondary switch geared. Uh, just to note, this is a building with chillers. It does have economizer mode to get some free cooling. Um, in this case study, those uh, economizer, economizers were not utilized, um, so just, just for a note. One thing you'll see in the result is a uh, mention of PUE, or power usage effectiveness. Uh, this is kind of a data center measuring point to see how, how efficient your systems are. And basically what it does is it looks at the total power compared to the power being utilized by the equipment. So in an ideal world, the PUE would be one. So every watt going into the building is being directly used to the equipment. So for the case study, um, we basically loaded up the data center with load banks scattered throughout. Um, the facility was loaded to about 1,300 kW, about 50% capacity. Um, the A and the B systems were placed into various modes of operation. So we started out with the A side and the B side, mostly going through double conversion, uh, recorded a 1.56 PUE. And then we adjusted the B side to uh, a VMS mode, which is basically the module management mode, where some of the modules, because we were only at 50% and they're A, B, so they're really only operating at 20%, the modules could be shut off and put in standby mode. And we did get uh, some efficiency of dropping the PUE to 1.5, and that equated to about $34,000 of savings a year. The next mode was to put both sides in the VMS mode. Again, we did see some reduction uh, in the PUE. Uh, that equated to about $80,000 of potential savings. And then we decided to put the UPS in eco mode. So we put one side in eco mode and one side in the variable management mode. Again, we saw another reduction to about one point, you know, 125,000. And then we put both systems into eco mode. And again, that was the lowest PU recording and it was about $150,000 of annual savings. This particular client um, spending all the money on the UPS systems and the reliability was not comfortable putting the UPSs in eco mode. So they've run their systems in the VMS mode. Um, about a year now, they one of their sides is connected to a high voltage tension line, so it's very um, very reliable. It doesn't fluctuate, so they're contemplating the next year to potentially put it in eco mode. So we'll see how that goes and see how much money they save. Um, so that is the case study. I'm um, going to turn it over to Rich to talk a little bit about efficiency incentives and some of the things we can do to help offset the cost. Um, to making your system more efficient. Thanks, Ken. So there are several different programs that can be considered, uh, and those energy savings that when you're looking at a project design, uh, the design team can communicate with the owner ahead of time and do the research to see what's available for energy rebates and tax credits to help offset the increases in initial costs that we've been discussing. Now, rebates may be found in the form of uh, energy company rebates that you can get, and typically that's when you have equipment replacement. So you'll communicate with your local energy company, see what kind of programs that they have available, what's the way that you go about actually procuring these might be equipment selection comparison. So we see these a lot for motors and pumps, adding VFDs, changing the LED lighting. But you'll want to communicate if swapping out your transformers, for example, or changing some of the way your electrical distribution system is designed during a major renovation, 
looking at those system losses and seeing if you can present that as a case for reducing energy and therefore getting your energy company to maybe give you some rebate. The design team also wants to go through and look at what is there both at the state level as well as the federal level for energy efficiency, what steps you're taking to reduce those on the norm, as well as if you're a greenfield building, what can you do as considered a baseline quality, and then what can you do to enhance that? Now, this may or may not be a LEED certified building, uh, but at the same time, you might be able to convince your local utility and your local state that you're taking steps to further reduce that energy and therefore the greenhouse footprint of the building. Uh, the yeah, EPA, Rich, yeah, go Rich, on, Ken. Just want to jump in. Yeah, one of the things we, when LEED first came out, we we had gotten into some situations where showing how we were being efficient got them to technology points. Um, so it's just an, option, an opportunity there. If you can prove that you're, you know, saving energy, you can actually get some additional points if necessary. So, excellent. Yeah. So you'll want to take a look to and see what the EPA has available for Energy Star certification, and then, you know, your LEED certification isn't necessarily something that you're going to be getting rebates for. But when you're going for those points, as Ken mentioned looking at how you can design your system architecture to maximize your energy savings and also you know, your cost every year is certainly prudent for the entire design team. This presentation has discussed several sources of energy loss that can be found in a variety of building types, really regardless of how you're occupying the building, whether it's healthcare or data centers or schools, even you know, government facilities and industrial facilities, a lot of the components that we've discussed exist in some form or in many forms. Right. Energy losses that are inherent in the system design can cost the client money over the life of the entire building. And these losses also increase the required utility electrical generation on this carry environmental impacts. And it's prudent for the design team to choose equipment ratings that can provide increases in energy efficiency. The design aspects that we've discussed, they include looking at resistances and losses within the distribution and within the conductors. We talked about how to size equipment, how to utilize equipment. As it relates to UPSs, how that architecture and how that system is designed and how it's operated all kind of factor in. I'd like to thank everyone for following along and attending our presentation. Uh, and we are happy to review and answer any of the questions that you may have. Okay, now let's get to some of these questions. And Rich, you get the first one. With the increased efficiency requirements for transformers, are they less robust? In other words, more susceptible to failure? So when we look at all of the losses that I kind of described within the transformers, and we look at how those are originated, whether they're load losses or whether they're core losses, we can think about how is a transformer constructed and how does that relate. So when we consider load losses or loads that or losses that vary and increase as load increases, those are usually helped by making things bigger, i.e. they become more robust. We use larger wire, we use copper instead of aluminum. So we can reduce those load losses by making transformers more robust. When we look at your core losses, which are essentially load independent, that's more of how that unit is constructed. And from what I can tell, looking at ways that transformers are constructed, I think the increase in cost that we see to increase energy efficiency, and certainly the 2016 uh, Department of Energy increases did increase overall transformer cost, is evidence that as we increase efficiency, we do increase robustness and therefore reliability. Okay, Ken, next question is for you. Uh, are DC uh, building electrical distribution systems being implemented uh, these days? Uh, and if so, how often? So we are seeing uh, the data center in the data center field, some uh, data centers going to DC. As I said, the most of the server components are DC-based. So when you look at the AC, UPS system, you go from an AC to a DC battery, then back from a DC to an AC, and then transfer AC, then it goes back to DC. So every time you make that conversion, you lose power. So going from a UPS to a DC distribution will actually save you energy because you lose those losses. Um, 
it's not many of them, um, but they are out there, and I think a big part of that, uh, they've kind of centered around a 30, 380 volts DC, so you're starting to see components be built at 380 volt DC, you start to see regulations, uh, standards, there's now arc flash, DC arc flash components that are out there. So, you know, we are starting to see more of it, um, mostly in the Asian market, I guess, um, but you're starting to see them in the data center, yes. Okay, Rich, next question's for you. Actually, um, it's a request to discuss the issues between UPSs and generators and why a UPS may not transfer from battery power to generator power. Thanks, Jack. So I've experienced this in the past where a UPS has a requirement for the power quality that comes in. And there's a limit at which harmonics within the incoming power can prevent that UPS from wanting to connect to that source. It basically sees it as low quality or unusable. Uh, when you're paralleling multiple generators, and especially if you're paralleling, happen to be paralleling generators by maybe different manufacturers, then you have an opportunity to have harmonic content that is not necessarily cooperative. For example, if you have parallel pitches because you happen to not have neutrals in the system, and it allows you to parallel generators to different pitches, you can end up with more harmonic content than you would normally see. In my experience, what happens is at certain times, the, depending on the nonlinear load and the harmonics in the rest of the system, the UPS doesn't want to connect to that. Now, the solution that I've seen in the past has been to add a isolation transformer between basically upstream of the UPS. The unfortunate side is, of course, now we're introducing losses to the Moore system by adding another transformer. But it does have the effect to clean up some of those harmonics. And as we were mentioning with K-rated transformers and the increase in nonlinear loads that we're seeing within buildings these days, uh, we're going to see more harmonic content being placed on there, which depending on the sensitivity or at least the limits of the input of that UPS uh, may or may not have an effect here. So if you're a facility and you're starting to see some of those problems, the first recommendation would be to take a look at the harmonic content coming in, put a scope on it, see what you're dealing with, and then that can help you narrow down a possible solution. Now, Ken talked about a variety of UPS factors that might affect inrush as well. Uh, Ken, do you have anything to add to this? Yeah, I think, you know, depending on the different types of UPSs and systems and modes, you know, they can affect the, the generator. I know when you have low load, the older UPS that had a lot of capacitance which could affect the generators going into leading power factors, so some things you had to be aware of. Um, you know, it's all stuff you need to be aware of when you're selecting the two together. Okay, Rich, here's another question for you. How do, you re um, how do the proposed architectures affect safety, such as arc flash safety and other electrical worker safety considerations? I know it's a little off topic, but it's, it's related. Absolutely. It certainly is on topic. I did have a slide that was talking about how transformer impedances will affect the available fault current on the secondary and how that then affects what you're going to experience for arc flash. Uh, taking that into consideration is, is really important. While it seems very you know, alluring to use the lowest possible impedance rating on a transformer to reduce energy, and it's a pretty substantial reduction, uh, the side effects of that might mitigate any benefit and might also mitigate any cost when you associate that with now the arc flash mitigation tech techniques that you have to go through. Uh, we've also seen how fuses can have more losses associated with them than breakers. And we didn't even get into the cop topic of how electronic trips will also have parasitic draw because they are circuits that's operating on that, on the electrical distribution. So really, it's, it's a pretty broad question that we want to make sure that when we're designing systems and we're taking into account first cost and we're taking into account, you know, the energy efficiencies and how we're, we, whatever matrix we put that into, we always take into consideration how that affects flux of coordination as well as how we affect arc flash and make sure that we're not putting the facility uh, technicians and operators in undue risks because we're trying to save a few, a few percent per year. Yeah, and I think, you know, when you talk about architecture, you know, having breakers that are fully adjustable can help, uh, you know, with the arc flash. You know, we talked about, you know, PDU losses and, 
you know, eliminating the PDU to eliminate the transformer losses, but that has an adverse effect on the short circuit. So just things you need to look at, at how you build the architecture. Uh, in that case, we tend to build smaller architectures, smaller transformers, so we have less fall current. Um, so it does, I agree, I agree with Rich. I mean, it does affect how, how the architecture is built. Yep, absolutely. More, distributing out the distribution, making everything smaller, you know, ha goes a long way to reducing uh, reducing that fault. And then also allows you to use higher voltage to distribute out to your various locations so that you have less conductor losses as well. Thanks. Okay, Ken, next question's for you. Um, uh, did you use RPPs at rack levels to distribute from UPS to data racks? or UPS uh, it's, does itself have panel boards to be able to connect to multiple data racks, and I think that refers to your case study. Yeah, the case the case study actually that that building used RPPs, so we came out of the UPS to distribution panel and then out to the RPPs. One of the things we were concerned we had looked at overhead busway systems, and uh, one of the concerns was just that fault current at the first cabinet was pretty high, so the client uh, chose to use RPPs. They also used them because they weren't building out all the rows, so they didn't want to invest in the overhead busway at that point, and so the RPPs made better sense. Um, the systems were kind of large to come right out of the UPS with uh, distribution um, branch circuits, so we try to come out with a larger feeder and then kind of shorter runs of smaller cable, again, to reduce the heat. Okay, Rich, next question is for you. What causes transformer vibration and how can it be reduced? Thanks, Jack. So when we were in the, in the slide with the unlabeled pie chart, I uh, was kind of listing all of the different losses that transformers can have. And both eddy currents and magnetostriction are responsible for the humming and the buzzing and the vibrations. When we think about magnetostriction, it's essentially the flux in the core is causing the cord itself to physically expand and then kind of contract slightly as the alternating magnetic field uh, affects the core. So you can imagine that expansion and contraction is essentially what would cause those friction losses as well as that vibration. Thanks, Jack, for bringing that slide up. In addition, when we consider that our flux leakage can induce eddy currents in adjacent materials, and then those eddy currents can cause the casing to slightly vibrate and slightly move. Uh, so when we're talking about how do we reduce that, it would be looking at what we, we consider the core losses of the transformer, the no load losses. That's why even if you don't put a load on a transformer, it has the, it'll still vibrate, it'll still buzz and hum. And then as we load that up more, we create more flux losses and stray magnetic field losses, which then induce eddy currents in adjacent surfaces which is why they will start to vibrate. The casing will vibrate more at higher loads. Uh, and anytime we're trying to mitigate those from the building standpoint, we're looking at vibration isolation on not only the transform, but any of the conduit supports that connect that transformer rigidly to the rest of the building system and structure. Uh, just I vibration isolation on the transformer pads alone usually aren't sufficient. Ken, the next question goes to you. Um, what facilities use uh, 415 240 volt power distribution? So the 415 240 is more of a European voltage. Um, so it's it's basically the same 208 120. Um, we mostly see it, like I said, the data center itself, the server cabinets basically have a power supply that are rated from 100 volts all the way up to 240, so they can operate anywhere in that voltage range, and it was basically done so that that same server cabinet could be used in Europe, can be used in the United States. Um, we tend to use the 120 volt distribution here in the States, and then what we what they're trying to do is to save that efficiency, remove the PDUs, and eliminate the impedance and losses in the PDU is to push that voltage higher to the higher limit and use the 240. So we distribute straight from the UPS at 415, 240 to the cabinet to do that. So that's where we normally see that um, becoming more popular now as, as we try to get as much efficiency out as we can out of the data center. You might see it in some lab equipment that might have a, a European component to it where they're bringing equipment that they use overseas to here, um, but it's not typically used. We typically see it more now in the data center.
Okay, we have time for one more question. And Rich, it goes to you. What percentage of transformer impedance is resistive versus inductive? Thanks, Jack. So as we're looking, and we kind of talked about how that percent impedance is going to vary uh, based on the way that the transformer is designed, and then how the resistive nature of the, of the windings are going to vary based on not only the material selection of aluminum versus copper, but also the rate of rise. So the 80 degree is going to have a lower rate of rise, thus more mass, more surface area, more copper, more aluminum over what we're going to have if we do 150 degree C. So I guess the answer to that question is really to say it, it depends. It depends on how it's, instruct, how it's constructed and what materials are being used. Uh, but certainly a comparative graph to say here's all the different combinations you could possibly achieve is something you'd want to communicate with your transformer vendor. Uh, you know, we've talked about a couple different types, right? We've talked about TP1 and CSL3 and, and NEMA Premium. There's also ultra-efficient, I say ultra with you know, air quotes, transformers that have even better efficiencies. Now, they're going to make advantage by trying to minimize losses, and each one of those manufacturers does it in their own kind of proprietary way. So I'd say in order to answer and figure out what's the best solution for your client based on inductive versus resistive losses, and if you're really interested in digging into that deeper, I think it's a study of all the manufacturers that you're interested in, see what they can piece together for you for that percentage. So essentially, transformers we can model as a circuit that's a resistor and an inductor associated with the winding. So it varies, but it's certainly something that could be determined for a specific product line. Thanks. I'd like to close by thanking our great speakers, Ken Kutsmita and Rich Vedvik, for kindly sharing their time and their knowledge and their expertise. I'd also like to expend a, extend a special thank you to our sponsor, ASCO Power Technologies, for supporting today's webcast. And now that we're about done, we want your feedback. Because in the short survey, will pop up on your screen as soon as the webcast ends. Please take a moment to complete it. We use this information to improve our webcasts. Finally, on behalf of Consulting Specifying Engineer, Pure Power, and CFE Media, thanks for attending the webcast. This now concludes the webcast. Thank you, and goodbye. <laughs>